This is the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Kendall of the notaballerina.com travel blog. Every episode, I'll share travel tales from several fellow travel lovers, and together we hope to entertain and inspire you, remind you of some of your own great travel experiences, and encourage you to hit the road again soon. Hello and welcome to episode 241 of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Today's episode is about emotional travel. So, you know, travel isn't always fun. Sometimes travel can be difficult or sad and sometimes travel will actually be a really emotional experience, but we always learn something from it and it's absolutely still worth doing. So my guests today have had three quite different examples of this. Uh, some of it's the kind of travel that uh, often gets referred to recently as as dark tourism, but dark kind of implies to me that it's bad. So I've decided to call it emotional travel instead. The kind of travel you do, well, you don't do it because you have a fun day out, but maybe you do it because you want to understand more about the world around us. So uh, anyway, that's what we've got today. My first guest is Henry Gold. I had an incredible chat with Henry a couple of weekends ago. Um, started off with his telling me about being attacked by an elephant, which he briefly references in our chat ahead, but which you will hear much more about in, in great detail in a future episode. It's an incredible story. But for uh, this episode about emotional travel, uh, Henry talks um, in part about his parents who were Holocaust survivors, and that's what this story is really about. So a content warning, I, I guess you can imagine, there'll be some sad bits ahead. You know, my my parents both survived the Holocaust. Um, um, in fact, uh, I don't I don't have uh, close relatives because my my parents lost <clears throat> lost both both older siblings. Well, my 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 father had one sibling who survived. Um, I never experienced what it is to have a grandfather, mm. grandmother. Um, um, so you know, it was it's part of me very much so. So whenever I go, and I've been to, for example, Cambodia or Rwanda, I make a point to go to the museum, to go and spend time. I, I usually make it a day. Um, wherever there's been a... Um, every country I go through, whether there's been... And just about every country has some history, which is very bad. Mm. Or, I don't know, sad, let's put it. Not very bad, very sad. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I make a point. I, I want to learn about it. Um, I want to read about it. I want to empathize. I want to remember. Um, again, part of my my heritage is trying to remember not only to what happened, but the people who you know who never had a life, never had an opportunity. Um, and therefore, I go. I go. You know, as I said, I went to Cambodia. I, I went to. I, I was. I, I didn't go specifically for this to Cambodia. You know, I didn't go specifically to Rwanda. But when I'm there, mm-hmm. I will not miss it. Mm-hmm. Because to me, this is this is a very important part of the place of the culture of understanding um, why this thing can happen and why they keep doing keep happening and and mm. this yeah learn, learning from it um, it speaks to me um, and and as I said I, I so yeah, I, I don't avoid it. I've been to Auschwitz. I've been to, you know, I go to other places when, when I'm in an area. Um, I did go to Auschwitz with my mom, so that's not a special, you know, that was a special trip. Wow. That was a dark trip. So my mom, I um, I convinced my mom, again, she was already in her uh, late 70s, to to pack up all her grandchildren, well, the, the, the older grandchildren, and myself, my brother, and my sister. And um, and we traveled as a family, and wow. so she could show us where she was. So that was a dark place. Wow, that was a difficult that was a difficult trip for everybody. Yeah, um, very emotional. Uh, and we were all on our edge, mm. and uh, and that, that's a very difficult. Uh, we went to the museum there, where you could literally look up her name there, oh. the record, uh, um, and and so on. So that was. You know, um, but again, I I organized it. I encouraged my mom to come. Uh, my was mom she... was a very unique person. Mm. Yeah, go. I'm going to ask: Was she reluctant to go, or was she? Did no. she want? No. She wanted to go. Mm. No, mm. she wasn't. She actually took my father there in in the fifties. Oh, right. Okay. Because, uh, so my mom was very unusual to many of the survivors mm. um, that that I would say because. 
you know, um, she talked about it when I was a kid. Mm. Um, she, in, in fact, my my mom, I think, had a had a good life as far as take, take as far as what she took, what she took, she, she took what she could out of it mm-hmm. because she talked about it because mm. she didn't feel it wasn't her fault what happened. Mm. Um, she did. She did tell us that she she, she was that she was thinking of committing suicide after the war, mm-hmm. when she found out she had eight siblings. There were eight siblings, mm-hmm. and she found out that nobody left. So at that point, she felt so alone, and and that she just thought that you know there's no meaning to life. She was going to kill herself. Yeah. Um, but interestingly enough, she was babysitting for a friend, and a little girl was four or five who kept saying, "Why are you so sad? Why are you oh. so sad?" Why are you so sad? Don't worry about it. Why are you so sad? And and you know the the people are up in heaven and you wanna see them. They're okay. They're good. Oh. Don't worry about it. You know, little girl. Um, my mom told that story often. Um, and at that point, she con- she makes she convinced herself. You know, it's not my fault. Mm-hmm. Nothing I can do. I have no idea why I survived, how I survived. But I'm not gonna live my life. And and she was willing to talk about it. And as a result, she didn't suffer. Yeah, and the way and and our and the kids often people say, well, you know, they would never hear from the parents. Well, my mom always, if when asked, she talked about it, mm-hmm. and um, that does sound a healthier uh, way. But, it's obviously difficult to do, but it sounds healthier um, to and, and, and to not hide. And it I adopted away. the same thing with the elephants. You know, mm-hmm. I, I knew that I had to talk about it right away because if I don't, you're going to start having nightmares, PTSD. Mm-hmm. You know, all of mm-hmm. these things. Yeah, I, I, I always feel that the key element is to get it out of your system, talk about it. Um, in fact, repeat it as often as possible because that's how you, you know, deal with it rather than let yeah, it that's how you process these things, isn't it? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, um, wow. Um, I so. visited Auschwitz myself, and it was so impactful. And I, you know, it's 15 years ago, and I still think about it so often. And and like for weeks afterwards, I couldn't think of anything else. I cannot imagine visiting with you know with your mother who was there. I mean, and and all your family. Then how? Wow, that's um, would have been an exceedingly yeah. emotional time. It was an interesting, you know, we were walking through the uh, through the camp, and uh, my mom was speaking English, explaining things to us, to the kids, to the grandkids. Um, and all of a sudden, we realized there was a bunch of other people following and being part of the group because <laughs> they wanted to hear from uh, yeah. someone who's been there. Yeah. Oh, um, so, yeah. so, so. Yeah, really and uh, you know, so you know, it's a personal story because she would point out this, and this is where the, this is where this happened to me, or this is what, this is where I got beaten up, and, mm-hmm. and this is where you know, and, and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, it, it was a very, very emotional time. But um, as I said, I think these things are important. Mm-hmm. I think it's very important um, that you face this thing and you deal with them. Otherwise, they're they evolve into something else. Yeah, and and yeah. Um, so again, that's why I I think going to if you will dark places or dark travel, whatever you want to call it, I think it's to me, um, it's very much part of being alive and, mm. and mm-hmm. you know living your life fully. Lots of wisdom in this chat with Henry. I um, actually gave me plenty of goosebumps even just listening back. Certainly did at the time as well. Uh, my own experiences at the Auschwitz and Birkenau camps, as I mentioned in our chat, are still very, very strongly with me to this day. Uh, I, I'll leave a link in the show notes to a blog post I've written about it. Um, so if you want to know more detail, I won't go, I won't uh, discuss it here, but uh, I have a, a blog post called Why I'm Glad I Visited the Auschwitz and Birkenau Concentration Camps um, over at Not a Ballerina, and I'll put a link in the show notes so you can uh, go and have a look. I had a long discussion with my son, uh, after I'd chatted with Henry about exactly this, why you would want to go, because his initial reaction as an 11-year-old was, oh, it sounds awful, why would you want to go? But we chatted and uh, he understood that, uh, yeah, actually he would like to someday visit uh, the concentration camps as well, that it is an important thing to do. Now, my next guest is Carol Anna Listenby, and her story of emotional travel takes place in Japan when she and her mother go to Hiroshima? Um, When I was living in Japan, at the end of my time there, after I had finished my contract, my mother came and visited me. She'd she'd always wanted to go to Japan. She'd always been fascinated by Japanese culture. And she'd um, written a paper on 
radiation sickness after the bombing of Hiroshima Mm -hmm. when she was in college. So one of the places, top on our list of places she wanted to go in Japan was Hiroshima. So um, we went there. We saw the the atomic dome, which is the it's um, the building that was right under the detonation of the atomic bomb. Which it's a skeleton, but it's still standing. And we went to the Peace Memorial Museum. And my mom absolutely absolutely loved it. That was her favorite part of being in Japan was being in Hiroshima, seeing this place she'd learned about all her life, really connecting with things that had been stories to her before. And when we were going through the museum, in one of the rooms, they had artifacts from the day of the bombing. One of them was... It was a tricycle that had belonged to a three-year-old boy who had died of radiation sickness clutching his bicycle. Mm. And when I read that story, because, I mean, he was the same age as some of my, some of my students in Japan, and I connected to that more than I did to any of the previous things I'd seen, and I just broke down crying in the museum. Which I'm sure is pretty common at the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. Mm-hmm. Um, it was an incredibly difficult day for me, but I was really happy that I was able to bring my mom there and let her experience that. Did she also get emotional? <laughs> she did, but she didn't break down crying. <laughs> But it must have been, yeah, for her to have researched it in depth and to know so much about it and then to be in that very place. Like Carolina and her mother, I've also visited the uh, Peace Memorial in Hiroshima in Japan and found it also a really emotional experience. I, of course, probably many uh, kids of my generation, we grew up learning about the story of Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes and that was a story that had always stuck with me. And then to see all the paper cranes around the memorial and to learn about, you know, so many tragic stories and situations connected to the to the bombing at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, it was, um, yeah, it was awful, but important, like we've already said today. So, um, yeah. <laughs> now, my final, this is emotional travel stories. They're a bit emotional, aren't they? Now, my final story today is actually uh, connected to wildlife tourism, but the kind of um, when you are confronted with animals that also their situations make you emotional. Uh, so I chatted with Tim Tricker, one of our great listeners, and he was telling me about some incidents in Thailand a few years back that uh, he, well, wished wishes now, I guess, didn't occur. When we ended up in Bangkok, we went we went to a few markets and saw all the um, delightful goods of like Rolex watches for twenty pound <laughs> and stuff like that, as you do. Yeah. Um, there's, but we went to Chachitak Market. Mm-hmm. Um, we went there on two separate days. The first day we went, I th- I can't remember what day it was. I think it was a Saturday. And it was a, a general market. Again, it had all the your typical market stores selling like clothing and like watches, every sort of bits and pieces, like little gift trinkets and everything. Um, but we also went on a Thursday as well because we was in that area. And mm. We thought, you know, there's people going in and out of the market. We'll see what's going on there. And this time we went in there, and it was went from being sort of like you could see. When we first went, there was like Western people there. You know, sort of, you could see there was loads of tourists there, but it seemed a lot more local. So I thought, oh, this will be a sort of good experience, you mm. know, sort of integrating more of the locals. Um, but they ended up, it ended up being like an an exotic pet trade. Oh no! And, and I, I am sort of big on my animal rights. I love of of all animals. You know, I I thought. I, I just hoped and prayed that they would be all sort of kept nice and tidy, but I didn't have high mm. hopes of that. Mm. And it did really sort of upset me. Like as I was walking around, you see um, these cages with 
puppies in there and they were stacked like four the cages were stacked four high oh. and these cages could barely contain them it was it's sort of quite distressing sort of walking around and you see all these like really rare and exotic birds kept in minute cages oh. and like fish in they should be like they should have been kept in like tanks with proper filtered water but they was kept in like little plastic bags on the floor Oof. i was told by one of the guys it is safe to keep them in there but you know I've, I've kept fish previously and it's definitely not the ideal environment literally it's only from transporting from a shop to the to your house like they yeah briefly yeah that. but yeah. they've been kept in there for hours if not days mm. and went into another part which had a had fish in tanks but they was completely cramped in there there was like conflicting species what were fighting with each other oh. and there was like they had like their younger sort of generation of people there going around with like these little fishing nets sort of like scooping out the ones what have been attacked or ones what have sadly passed oh gosh and just and i was just like this is just completely just dis- depressing you know is we we love thailand we sort of went all, sort of uh, all around Bangkok, that area, we had such a good time. Mm. It was sort of a very eye-opening thing. But going to the Chachitak market, it was very like it was quite quite depressing. It was mm. really sort of bad. But also on our trip to Bangkok, we went to the Tiger Temple. Um, we was yeah. assured by one of our guides that the previous management, where they had not looked after the tigers, have or been arrested they've they're not going to you know they're very well looked after now we they don't do half of the things what they used to do as in like letting people walk around and everything and he assured us you know it's absolutely perfect and this is where my sort of naivety sort of came into it i took that on face value rather than sort of doing a bit of research we booked ourselves to go on to this this tour to the tiger temple and when we turned up there it was it was tidier than I thought it would be. Um, but when we sort of walked into the first sort of area, there was a tiger, what was on a leash, but it was being held by one of the workers there. Mm. And it looked healthy. It was a healthy sort of size. And it was sort of walking around, walking around in this sort of penned area. So I thought, you know, they're making sort of inroads from what I've previously seen. Mm. <laughs> Then we walked round the corner and it sort of went into this like little um this like little valley where there was like it was like an entrance to a theme park. There was massive queues, had a turnstile. Mm. Just the other side of that you just see all these tigers on the floor. And we had some of the tour guys who were one of them was Australian, the other one was from Denmark. And they were saying, Oh no, these animals are very well looked after, you know, mm. they're very docile because they're um you know, because they're interacting with humans all the time, you know, they're perfectly fine. And I'm thinking, these are wild animals. Exactly. They should not be... This is not a normal habitat or situation no, for them. They should not be kept in this sort of... around this sort of commotion around them. Mm. And secondly, they're not the type of animal what will... You, they can be tamed, but not to the extent where they look completely out of it. Yeah. And we never went down there we went straight back to the where the buses were what were taking us and mm. we ended up sitting in the restaurant there for about an hour and a half waiting for all the rest of it, the people on our tour to come mm-hmm. back i mm-hmm. thought i just don't want to go down there because i will end up saying something and yeah like kicking off a bit and yeah. i'll probably end up getting arrested and mm. i don't ever want to do that no not <laughs> in a well, foreign country I'll particularly like, yeah Oh. I'm bite my tongue. I'm going to go just sort of stay away from it because I just can't trust myself not to react. Yeah. And Ugh. when we came back, it was about two weeks afterwards, we found out they had, in fact, arrested a lot of people who worked there. There was charities what now look after the tigers sort of all, all around Thailand, giving them a better life. The whole place was closed down and it's oh, no good. longer a thing. Ugh. I'm not glad that I went there at all. You know, but I'm also glad that it's now not a thing where anyone mm. can go to. So, yeah. from what I sort of got from that as well is sort of listening to tour guides and people who are trying to sell you tickets. They're more interested in 
generally they're more interested i'm not saying everyone's like it but they're generally more interested in getting the money out of you rather than sort of being honest and mm, giving th- you the, it can the certainly situation happen situation should be yeah yeah you know, if they'd have said that it was yeah you know, if they wouldn't have said they were looked after i would not have dreamt of going i certainly feel the same as tim and seeing any animals in you know clearly in distress or in you know really sad circumstances is a really emotional thing and certainly something that um, is we can try to avoid. And I think these days, so I think Tim's experience in Thailand was four or five years ago, I think it's a lot easier these days to get uh, more honest and more useful uh, feedback and reviews and ideas if we search um, online for these uh, about these kind of in, um, places. So uh, always do your research before you go. And um, if you uh, see something awful, make sure you uh, try and see if there's anything you can do about it, even if it's just to warn others about uh, going in the future. But yeah, that is another aspect of emotional travel. So after this emotional journey of today, that's all I have for you for episode 241 of the Thoughtful Travel podcast. A big thank you to my guests who shared their stories uh, because It's even harder to talk about these kinds of topics, but super, super important and also, I think, really interesting. So I really appreciate that. So first up, I chatted with Henry Gold. Henry's the founder of of TDA Cycling, um, Tour de Afrique, and you can find more about uh, the tours they run at tdaglobalcycling.com. And as you can imagine, Henry's an amazing storyteller, and I have some more gold from Henry Gold coming soon. I next chatted with Carol Anna Listenby. Um, As well as being a podcast listener, thank you, uh, Carolina, I discovered, is a poet, and she's got a collection at Amazon titled Wisp of Fog Moment, and I've left a link in the show notes. And also a huge thanks to Tim, who is a fabulously, um, wonderfully engaged uh, group member of the Thoughtful Travellers group on Facebook. So thanks, Tim. Always good to chat with you. I'm also leaving a link in the show notes to my blog post about why I'm glad I visited the Auschwitz and Birkenau, Birkenau concentration camps. And there's a link to the Facebook group for Thoughtful Travellers if you can't find it just by searching Thoughtful Travellers in Facebook, which will probably work anyway. All of this information is in the show notes. And for today, they are at notaballerina.com slash 241. As always, thank you so much for listening. This has been another episode of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Show notes and other information are at notaballerina.com slash podcast. Join me again soon for another chat about why we travel. Bye for now. Bye.